this briefing. I'm very happy to invite Rose Gottmiller, Under Secretary of State for Arms Control and International Security. Control and international security. You will be able. Uh, you will have an opportunity to ask questions after Miss um, Gottmiller finishes her speech. Without any further ado. Good afternoon, everyone. It's a great pleasure and an honor to be here in Kyiv. I spent a very busy day meeting with many members of the government, having a very good opportunity to exchange views about the area that is my responsibility, which is nonproliferation, arms control, and international security, as well as a broad range of security issues uh, that are of concern and interest here in Ukraine, in Europe as a whole, and of course uh, to us in the United States as well. I thought I'd just begin with a few impressions. I began the day on Maidan on this very cold and foggy day. I have to say I was incredibly moved by all the memorials that I saw there to those who were shot by snipers, who suffered during uh, the Maidan demonstrations. It was uh, an incredible moment for me, quite honestly. But I also thought to myself how much has happened in the past year. It seems like 10 years to me since last December. It probably seems like 100 years to you because there have just been so many developments uh, in the ensuing period. But uh, one thing I wanted to say as a very important message to the Ukrainian people, to the Ukrainian government, is that the United States is a strong and staunch partner of Ukraine. We are uh, here to be working with you to support your independence and your democracy and to be working with you to tackle the difficult problems that Ukraine must tackle, such as corruption and, of course, the conflict on your eastern borders. So we are really ready to buckle down and work together. I like to focus on pragmatic problem solving, and that is what we are here to talk about uh, today in terms of the areas that are, again, under my control, such as export control and uh, uh, security assistance, security cooperation, and uh, these types of things. Now, the other thing I wanted to talk about is the fact that today is the 20th anniversary of the entry into force of the Budapest Memorandum. I was one of the negotiators of the Budapest Memorandum on the U.S. side. I uh, was in Budapest 20 years ago today with President Clinton at the time when uh, the Budapest Memorandum entered into force, and I just had an excellent opportunity to speak with President Kravchuk about it. It was a great honor for me to meet with President Kravchuk and have an opportunity to talk with him about it. And I mentioned that to me it is a very strong indicator of the strength of Ukraine's leadership of the nonproliferation regime that 20 years ago this country decided to join the nonproliferation treaty as a non-nuclear weapon state reducing and eliminating the more than 1,000 nuclear warheads that were deployed at the time on Ukrainian territory. I know this is a matter of controversy here, and perhaps we can discuss it today, but you know, I see Ukraine's leadership of the nonproliferation regime as having led directly to the success that we have been able to achieve in further nuclear arms reduction and disarmament over the past 20 years. I was the chief negotiator for the United States of the New START Treaty, the New Strategic Arms Reduction Treaty that entered into force in February of 2011. Even in this most difficult of times with the Russian Federation, we are continuing to work with Russia to reduce and eliminate strategic nuclear weapon systems. And without, I think, the leadership of Ukraine and the other countries who joined in the Budapest Memorandum, this kind of continued 
nuclear disarmament would not be possible. So as we go into the Non-Proliferation Treaty Review Conference this coming spring, I strongly, I strongly salute Ukraine as one of the key leaders of the non-proliferation regime, and we look forward to working with you in New York during the Non-Proliferation Treaty Review Conference to continue to strengthen and develop all three pillars of the NPT, the disarmament pillar, the non-proliferation pillar, and the pillar that has to do with peaceful nuclear uses. President Kravchuk, in turn, had some words of wisdom for me, and I wanted to let you know what he had to say. I thought it was very important. He said, we have to work together. We have to hang together, and we have to stay united in the face of this very difficult crisis and conflict in eastern Ukraine. We must do everything we can to continue the strong efforts uh, with economic sanctions, the strong efforts to work together with the European Union and the United States to ensure that, that Russia knows we are of one mind in this regard that the actions that they have taken in seizing the Crimea and in participating in the conflict in eastern Ukraine, these are actions that contravene international law and really are very, uh, very negative impacts on the international system overall and on international security in the end. So I thought President Kravchuk had a very important message. Again, it was a huge honor for me to meet the president. After so many years, I had met him during the negotiation of the Budapest Memorandum, but it was uh, a great honor and pleasure to have this opportunity. So again, I'm delighted to be here in Kyiv. It's been an action-packed day. I'm going tomorrow with Ambassador Jeff Pyatt, our ambassador here to Kharkiv to uh, launch the neutron source facility, which is an important uh, nuclear uh, uh, research facility in Kharkiv. And I'm very glad that we, the United States, have been able to work together with Ukraine once again to support your scientific base, which has been such an important uh, area of achievement in, uh, in uh, the nuclear sciences over the years. And I do believe that this neutron source facility will be an important continuing step forward in the strength of your uh, nuclear science, your nuclear physics uh, arena. So with that, uh, I'll throw the floor open to your questions. And again, thank you. Thank you to the Ukraine Crisis Media Center for this opportunity to speak this afternoon. Thank you very much. Thank so. you so much for making it up to us and for the ongoing partnership and support the United States demonstrate to Ukraine. Thank Let's you. Questions. questions, please. OK, go ahead. Uh, Yulia Mandel. Yourself also for support that USA gives to Ukraine today, but my question is a little bit controversial, and uh, it considers like, do you still consider that uh, that historic decision of Ukraine to give up the nuclear uh, weapons was right 20 years ago? Thank you. I have a simple answer to that question. Yes, and I'll tell you why. Think about it. Do you think Ukraine would have been better off? with uh, nuclear weapons over a long and uh, what would have uh, been a, an unstable period of crisis and continuing crisis involving the nuclear weapons. I think that that is something very important to consider when people are now questioning whether it was the right decision to make or not. I think, in fact, uh, the continuing uh, lack of resolution of that question would have contributed to a very unstable and very uncertain 20 years in not only Ukraine's history, but also in the history of the entire world, because it would have placed a barrier in the way of further nuclear disarmament elsewhere in the world. As a result of Ukraine's very courageous and correct decision, and uh, taking leadership in this matter, we have been able to continue to march down the road that President Obama laid out so uh, clearly in Prague in April of 2009 when he said we must proceed step by step in every way to work toward the peace and security of a world without nuclear weapons. 
and uh, the president feels quite firmly, as do I, that nuclear weapons in the end do not l bring security. If nuclear weapons or fissile material fall into the hands of terrorists, that means the end of security for everyone. And so for that reason, I say that Ukraine's uh, very well-considered and courageous decision back in 1993, 1994 have, has actually enabled this latter period of nuclear disarmament. And so again, I take off my hat to Ukraine. I give uh, great credit to Ukraine and to the other countries, Kazakhstan, Belarus, who made the decision to join the uh, NPT as non-nuclear weapon states back in 1994. We have a question from the first row. Uh, Radio Liberty, Jana Bespichuk. Um, uh, could you please uh, describe in, deta in detail the current state of cooperation between the US and Russia in the realm of uh, disarmament and non-proliferation, -prolifer uh, especially taking into consideration that the Budapest Memorandum was violated by Russia and the guarantees that it provided, uh, they, they mean nothing today. Thank you. It's very interesting because there have been um, three particular areas involving weapons of mass destruction where despite this very, uh, very serious, this terrible crisis in eastern Ukraine, we have been able to continue some uh, very uh, good cooperation with the Russian Federation. The first uh, is an area I've already mentioned, that is the New START Treaty. We have continued to uh, implement the New START Treaty with the Russian Federation to reduce and eliminate nuclear weapon systems. So um, what does that mean? 18 times a year, we get to go and inspect Russian strategic nuclear uh, bases where they are deploying submarines, bombers, intercontinental ballistic missiles. We get to go and inspect those. We also uh, get to uh, receive regular information about the movement of Russian strategic forces. So every time they move an uh, intercontinental ballistic missile from a silo to a maintenance facility, they have to notify us, they have to inform us. So as a result, we have a very good 24-7 idea about the status of Russian strategic nuclear forces. This is good for stability, it's good for mutual predictability, and in the long run, it's good for international security. It's good for the whole world system of security. And I want to stress that this is a, an agreement that is completely reciprocal. So we go 18 times a year to Russia, and the Russians come 18 times a year to the, Uni to the United States. We provide them the same kind of information about our strategic forces. So it's... Uh, I think it's a, a story that needs to be told that the long history of strategic arms limitation and reduction is one of steadily increasing predictability and stability. And we hope, frankly, that it will continue to have beneficial effects despite this uh, serious crisis that's going on here in Ukraine. The second area where we've been able to cooperate with the Russians uh, very well up to this point is the so-called P5 plus one talks on Iran, where we are seeking um, a, an agreement that will re remove any concerns that the Iranians are producing a nuclear weapon. And here too, the Russians have been good partners uh, at the negotiating table. The third area does not involve nuclear weapons, but it involves chemical weapons in Syria. And over the past year and a half, we have again worked very closely with the Russian Federation and a very large international partnership. Many countries around the world have participated to remove 1,300 tons of chemical weapons from Syria and ensure they are destroyed. So here again, we've had some good cooperation. So I would say there are some, uh, some positive areas where we are cooperating with the Russians. And then there are some areas that are very negative where we are very, very concerned about what they are doing. Uh, and uh, it's a very, I will say, interesting mixed picture. Let's take the question from the gentleman. Yeah, Interfax Ukraine, Igor Slovay. I was speaking uh, Ukrainian. Okay. You told about Budapest uh, memorandum, and uh, that's why I have my question. 
What is the system of international security should come to replace um, uh, Budapest uh, Memorandum, to come uh, to the status quo which we had before annexation of Crimea and before attack on Donbass in the east of Ukraine? And the second question, is it possible to recognize uh, DNR and LNR as terrorist organizations in the east of Ukraine? L is is uh, the first question was about uh, about uh, what can replace uh, the Budapest memorandum is there another instrument and the second and the second and the second question was about uh, those uh, newly uh, uh, like so so called governments in the east of ukraine <laughs> thank you uh, thank you very much uh, you know that the Budapest Memorandum is a part of an entire system of international law uh, and international legal structures. It's not the only area where we have been concerned about uh, the Russian uh, assault on sovereignty and territorial integrity. Uh, the the uh, UN Charter is one such document. The OSCE Basic Principles, that's another area. Uh, the uh, Budapest Memorandum is part of an entire system of international uh, uh, treaties, agreements, and, uh, and uh, regimes that serve as the uh, legal superstructure for, uh, for the international system. And we continue to be concerned that at the, at the core of the, the problem here is the uh, issues that are raised when any country around the world, in this case Russia, but any country around the world fails to respect the sovereignty and territorial integrity of its neighbors. So I just wanted to say that, that this is a big issue that has to do with big concepts of international law, but the Budapest Memorandum is not uh, unique in the way that it serves to uh, serves to bolster sovereignty and territorial integrity. It's part of a, a big system of international law, including the UN Charter and including, uh, and including other doc important documents. Uh, so for that reason, I would say the, the core of the problem is uh, not the system of international law that's been established by these treaties, by these agreements, by these regimes. The core of the problem is that the Russian Federation uh, is stepped aside from its commitments under these documents. So that's the core of the problem. I wouldn't say that a replacement is necessary. We have in place the system of international law. The problem is we have to continue to address uh, the issues that arise when any country steps outside the, the system of international law and uh, really uh, begins to shake its foundations to really cause problems for its foundation. For that reason, we have put in place a very strong system of sanctions against the Russian Federation, uh, sanctions that involve the European Union as well as the United States. I think it's important to continue to hang together very closely in implementing these sanctions and to uh, be ready to work uh, if the Russian Federation is ready to solve the problems through the Minsk uh, process. Uh, if they're ready to solve the problems in eastern Ukraine and Crimea, then to be ready to move as one away from the sanctions regime. But there are some very precise steps that we have put on the table uh, with regard to when any kind of sanctions relief would occur. In the meantime, the most important message is that we must continue to hang together in strongly implementing this system of sanctions. Uh, with regard to the regimes in uh, eastern Ukraine, we've been clear that uh, we do not believe that any of the activities they have had going on are, are legal. We've been very concerned about many aspects uh, of what is going on and that includes uh, the recent uh, elections, the recent referenda, and uh, the actions that appear to be criminal in nature in terms of uh, the misuse of economic resources and so forth in the region. So there are many, many reasons to condemn what is going on in eastern Ukraine. Uh, Grigory Zhugalov, uh, One Plus One TV channel. Ah, yeah. hello. Uh, 
Many people in Ukraine actually believe that if Ukrainian, if Ukraine had uh, nuclear weapons, uh, uh, there won't be any war with Russia. Actually, the question is, uh, do you feel personal responsibility as a side, as a side of negotiations in Budapest uh, for the fact that the United States, as a side of memorandum, uh, didn't manage to protect Ukraine uh, in the face of aggression? Actually, uh, don't you feel that the United States didn't fulfill their obligations? I think that, uh, as a matter of fact, the United States has been fulfilling its obligations and has gone uh, every step toward continuing to defend and develop a means of bolstering Ukraine that it can. I think the most important steps we have been able to take is to serve as leaders of the international community to pull together this very, very coherent group of strong sanctions that are beginning to have an impact on the Russian economy. And we've seen time and time again that sanctions, they don't work in a snap. They need to accumulate their effect over time and then they begin to have an impact. I think that the United States leadership in the effort to put together this pan uh, program of sanctions, this package of sanctions between the EU and the United States, very strongly uh, developed, put in place, and now implemented, I think that shows our strong commitment to Ukraine and to Ukraine's independence, sovereignty, and territorial integrity. So I really don't accept the criticism that we have not done what we should do. I think that we have, in fact, in the best way possible for international peace and security, put in place some very strong tools to influence this situation. And we will continue to stand firmly with Ukraine to press forward in uh, defense of your international position. And uh, now I think I will also say that it's important for Ukraine to work to wrestle with its problems. I read President Poroshenko's uh, Wall Street Journal op-ed today. I thought it was very good, pointing to the way that a uh, new government is now in place in Ukraine. You had very solid elections a month ago. There's an opportunity now for Ukraine to pick up and move forward in a positive direction, dealing with the problems of corruption, dealing with the problems that have affected governance here in Ukraine. And uh, so I think this, this can be Ukraine's moment. And it's a moment that we will be with you to carry forward, we hope, for success. Do you have any more questions? Can we take one more question? One more question, yes. Yeah. The gentleman at the back of the room. Hi, Eric Randolph, AFP. Um, can we address the, 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 the point that's been mentioned a couple of times? Uh, you're an expert on nuclear deterrence theory. Do you think that Russia would still have invaded Ukraine if it had had nuclear weapons? My point is, yes, as an expert on nuclear deterrence theory, I will tell you that my point is that deterrence would not have been stable throughout these 20 years. We would have been in a constant state of crisis, not only uh, between Ukraine and Russia, but across Eurasia with the other states involved. Don't forget that Kazakhstan as well had over 1,000 warheads. Belarus had a smaller number, but nevertheless, it was a situation where we were trying to, I think, stabilize peace and security in Eurasia uh, in a way that would work for all countries and for which the countries involved would be fully compensated and also then have uh, their security bolstered. We regret, of course, that Russia has not lived up to its commitments underneath the Budapest, uh, under the Budapest Memorandum. But uh, the point, again, I've been trying to get across is that we have been able, in other ways, to pull together a very strong coalition of countries to put economic pressure where it needs to go and using the tools of sanctions to really make a clear, clear point that when countries are not living up to their commitments in uh, the international system, then there is a price to pay and it is a very serious price to pay. So I think it is important to put this whole question in a larger context and I want to end where I began. I have continued to watch progress toward the reduction and elimination of nuclear weapons from the Cold War high. The United States had 31,000, over 31,000 
nuclear warheads in its arsenal in 1967. And thanks to the processes that began with the negotiation of the Non-Proliferation Treaty and then subsequent reduction negotiations with the Soviet Union and later the Russian Federation, we have been able to steadily continue the process of reduction so that when New START is fully implemented in uh, 2018, we will have 1,550 deployed nuclear warheads. We have reduced already over 85% of our nuclear warheads, and we need to continue that process. It was Ukraine's courageous decision 20 years ago, along with Kazakhstan and Belarus, that have allowed us to continue on the path toward reduction and elimination of nuclear weapons. Nuclear weapons do not buy security. They do not provide security. In fact, they provide for instability. And if nuclear weapons should ever fall into the hands of terrorists, they provide for disaster. And so for that reason, I very much ascribe to President Obama's goals laid out in Prague in 2009 that we must move steadily to reduce and eliminate nuclear weapons. That's consistent with U.S. policy now for 50 plus years in the Non-Proliferation Treaty. I will say in closing that I only hope we can continue to work together with the Russian Federation to reduce and eliminate nuclear weapons and then work with the other nuclear weapon states around the world to reduce and eliminate nuclear weapons and fissile material because in the end that is the only way that security will be assured for the entire international community. So thank you for your attention. It's very great to uh, have the chance to be here with you today. And uh, I'll look forward to my next trip to Ukraine. Thank you very much. Thank you so much for addressing these questions. Oh, just one advertisement. If you're interested in the neutron source facility, we will have a press availability tomorrow in Kharkiv. And uh, so hope maybe some of you will be available there or your Kharkiv uh, colleagues and contacts to attend our press availability in Kharkiv. So thank you very much. Thank you so much.